to Joe Rosenblatt, who I don't know, maybe I met, I don't know. We have readings by Bill Bissett, for, excuse me if I don't pronounce all the words properly, Emma Chernoff, Myra Jem, Heidi Novick, and Susan Walker. First, I'm going to tell you something. There's also a classes for voice yoga, and there's some kind of um, voice yoga just for women or something? No, woman voice. Woman voice just for women. No, Jeff, but anyway, I'll explain it. Okay, okay. <laughs> so the first person we're going to have today is going to be Heidi Novick leading us into the first term. First poet, so And here's how you know it. The excellent was magnificent. Hello everybody, welcome. Thank you for spending this afternoon with us. Um, Okay, so um, I'll just explain a little bit about what Chad said. I have the privilege of doing the voice yoga program here once a month. And once a year, on December the 6th, we do vo woman voice. And it is not just for women, it's just women performers. And uh, we can talk about it later. Nordy is here, she's one of the performers. Gail Geltner did the uh, logo for it. So anyway, um, this is a, you know, this is a, a memorial for Joe Rosenblatt, really. And um, because I have, in Yiddish we say it's kovidish, it's, uh, it's a true privilege for me to be able to start off this afternoon. And so, um, this lovely picture of Joe, I think some of you have it, some of you may not. So I'll just read what it says in his biography. Joe was born in Toronto in 1933, the eldest of Sam and Bessie Rosenblatt's three children. He grew up in the Kensington Market area where he attended Central Technical High School at Harvard and Bathurst Streets. Joe worked as a laborer for the CPR. He was a political activist and a Trotskyist in his early years and maintained a strong interest in politics all his life. He began to write poetry in the 1950s and emerged onto the Toronto poetry scene in the 1960s. He was encouraged in his early writing year by the most important Canadian writers of his generation, particularly Milton Acorn and Gwendolyn McEwen, and mentored by literary giants Al Purdy and Earl Burney. In 1966, his first book, The LSD Leacock, was published by Coach House Press. Since then, he has published over 20 books of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction, often illustrated by his brilliant quirky pen and ink drawings. His selected poems, Top Soil, 1962 to 75, won the Governor General's Award for Poetry in 1976. In 1980, he and his wife, musician Faye Smith, and their son, Silas, moved to Qualicum Beach, where they shared their lovely home with a succession of fat and pampered cats. Joe fell in love with a spectacular BC landscape. He particularly enjoyed the ocean, rowing out often in his weather-beaten sea hag to fish. The old growth trees also enthralled him. His later sonnets on the mythic green man were inspired by those, quote, old timers, end of quote. Gradually, the birds, fish, and wild creatures inhabiting this new landscape became his enduring passion. Over his career, Joe held several writer-in-residence positions in Canadian libraries and universities, as well as short-term writer-in-residence positions at the universities of Rome and Bologna. Between 1987 and 1993, he toured Europe, giving readings and lectures in Italy, Sweden, and Finland. Two collections of his poetry were translated into Italian by Professor Alfredo Rizzardi at <coughs> the University of Bologna, who considered Joe one of the major contemporary poets writing in English. Joe was also an important visual artist. 
His drawings and acrylics showed in many exhibitions on Vancouver Island and Toronto. His drawings featured the same delightfully bizarre and creepy menagerie of domestic animals and wildlife that animated his writing, and his vivid paintings often verged tantalizingly into the realm of abstraction. Joe continued to produce outstanding work until the very end. His last book of poems and illustrations, quote, Bite Me, Musings on Monsters and Mayhem, end of quote, was published just before his death on March 11, 2019. Joe was a caring and generous man, much loved by his many close friends. He carried on a lively and extensive email correspondence with many of them. His letters were witty and full of news, often with goofy articles and running commentary attached. Any personal difficulties his friends experienced brought forth long, sympathetic letters from Joe, followed by concerned phone calls. We already miss that ongoing contact. Joe's departure is deeply painful for those who loved him, Marcy Katz. So this is my experience with Joe. You have already read it, and I have to plug this. This is one of the benefits of being part of the Secret Handshake, is this really remarkable newsletter that comes out every month with uh, poetry, with um, educational tools regarding schizophrenia, and it was put together by Michael Alzamora. What can I say? Michael is just such a gift to this community. It's, it's wonderful knowing him. Anyway, so this is my tribute to Joe. I've still got miles to go and gas in the tank, and I'm going. Going back to a time when you and I met Joe, and I'll revisit that time, and then I'll come ahead to the time Bill and I went to see you on Spadina Avenue in Toronto, and you reigned and reigned love on us all, seated in a crowded room, adorned with your swimming fish artwork and others, and you didn't remember me, and for that I am grateful. For in those days of yore, you were living on Dundas Street West, if memory serves. Somehow, composer Robert Daigneau was in this seat, scene, as was my friend Kim, who took me there to meet a great poet. She told you, Joe and Bob, that I was a virgin. You scoffed and mocked and traumatized me, and then gallantly said, quote, you can take your virginity and serve it on a silver platter, end of quote. Then you or Bob found a silver platter and handed it to me. I put it in my purse. You asked for it back. I demurred and left. I may still have it. I'm glad you didn't remember me. You left Toronto, grew in your own way as I did, and then we meet again, stronger, wiser, and grateful that some things are best left forgotten, and some places are still miles away, and as long as there's gas in the tank, we'll get there. <laughs> My other, uh, I, I had met Joe at a time in my life, I, I must have been maybe 19, when I was not nearly as articulate as I am now. I had zip confidence. And uh, if I wasn't friends with uh, Kim Levis, I never would have gone to uh, meet Joe. I never would have gone to meet Robert Daniel, who's a wonderful Canadian composer. And, um, those days are then. This is now. Also this year, the poetry community and the world at large lost Toni Morrison. This is my tribute to her. Make Uncertainty Your Ally. Written August the 6th, 2019, inspired by the courage and death of Toni Morrison. Make uncertainty your ally, a wise man once said. And I took those words as if they were a skein of yarn and knitted them into a cloak, wrapping my dilemmas in its warmth. For that, I am grateful. The words, the warmth, the hope. And in hours and then moments of quiet desperation, I thought I would lose that thread and it would all unravel, but it didn't. 
and for that I am, a, I am grateful. A caring friend called, another sent a letter, each knowing that I matter to them. Yet I saw the darkness and cried, where is the light? Where is my light? And then I let the thread go like a balloon sailing in the air, or a kite ready to be liberated. At first it felt like a leaf floating, relieved of being part of a tree, and then it felt like anguish, the uncertainty of the unfamiliar. A voice, a message sails on the wind crying, reach for grace, the dignity of imperfection. Be grateful, you have touched the face of boredom. Boredom would torture you, boredom would demean you. You came close and then you veered, Uncertainty did that for you. There is more to life than being certain. There is hope, a dream yet to be discovered. You cannot do it when you are assured. It must be done when you need an ally. Know they are there, all your allies. They are hidden in the invisible uncertainty. Be grateful, walk in dignity, have hope. Let the dream find you. You got rid of what didn't serve you. The smile will come. Your heart will fill with gladness. This is the promise of time. It is yours. Look no longer at what doesn't serve you. Go forth. Be grateful. Be. So, I just want to talk a little bit about another project that I'm involved in. It's called um, I'm Mad, I Matter, Making a Difference. It's an, uh, it's an acrostic, so um, it, it's, uh, it's also an endeavor with the Friendly Spike Theatre Band and with full support of Bill Bissett. Bye! Nice to see you! Thank you for coming. See you again, we hope. Okay, so I'm not, this is very long. I am not going to uh, go through the whole thing. Uh, I just, but I do, I do want to talk about it. This is a tone poem. Um, I wrote it. It's based on the 20 year history of Mad People's Theatre in Toronto. Uh, so this is the text. There's going to be music. There's going to be what I call a Greek chorus, but it's really the sound of dogs, and I'll give you an example. We're going to make it into um, an illustrated book and a CD, and I'm not sure if Henry is going to put it on YouTube, but anyway, so it's going to be uh, filmed as well. Anyway, and it, so the Greek chorus, to give you an idea, pay strict attention, you are going to be asked to uh, participate. So this is called, um, I'm Mad, I Matter, Making a Difference. It's an acrostic, read me across or read me straight up and down. Howling back for the Friendly Spike Theatre to fan. Every dog has his and or her day. In his epic poem, Howl, written in 1956, Allen Ginsberg wrote, quote, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, end of quote. 33 years later, in 1989, the Friendly Spike Theatre Band, a company named after two dogs, Friendly and Spike, began shaping a new understanding of madness based on their own lives' experience. They did this through play creation. My name is Honey Novik. This is my poem detailing the history of the company and my involvement with this extraordinary endeavor, a relationship going into two decades. With the help of founder-director Ruth Ruth Stackhouse, I'm detailing the history of this company by howling back at tragic madness and creating something beautiful. Please howl with me when I give you the cue. I'm talking to you. Got it? Okay. I'm not just speaking here. I'm saying howl with me when you get the cue. Well, Bar Ginsburg, your generation ain't the only frickin' one, and so we howl at the dogma at the dog rule and doggity daughters because I have seen the greatest minds of my generation excel because of madness. We're mad and we're proud. Oh! Oh! Hey little 
doggy, did you hear it? Listen, we're howling back to all the Allen Ginsbergs of the world. I stamp my feet, wiggle my tail, howl, howl back. Because I, we are howling for one, two, three, four, forwards towards a new creative vocalization of yips, barks, growls, sniffs, slobbers, nips, pulls, dicks, licks, bites, snuggles, puddles. No, I am resilient, not destroyed. I am emerging. I'm mad. I matter. Making a difference. Singing this song. This is an Your time and my time are different. You lived during the beat generation. I live in a time when I can move to my own beat, when I can write poetry, beat poetry for Bill Bissett. In a complacent world, let sleeping dogs lie. They are content, and if not content, they become distracted. You know, sex, sex, drugs, bugs, pugs, hugs, rock and roll, until one curious awakened bitch starts to stir. Like a tenacious terrier, she asks questions. She sees stories. She knows she can make a difference, doggone it. And so, with her cohorts, cuddly smiles, um, <laughs> and barking sun dog, they make theater. The Wool Gatherer, March Festival of the Arts, it's happening, Rochdale. Rochdale Bard Ginsburg, where you and, Mas and Maestro John Burroughs came to sniff at the goings-on and on to U of T, where you, Bard Ginsburg, you and your drum found me. We are connected in time and events and concerns and business. Do you hear me? These are the dog days of summer, hot, sultry, just waiting for the heat to stir the cockles of the unfilled, unfulfilled heart. Chorus and, and performers speak out loud. Hey, little doggy dude, do you hear it? Listen, we're howling back to all the uh, Allen Ginsbergs of the world, to the yips, barks, growls, sniffs, slobbers, nips, pulls, dugs, licks, bites, snuggles, cuddles. My howly, howling, howlies. We don't need your sympathy. We need opportunity. Housing, education, socialization, inclusion. Accessible urban parkland, we need to destroy stigma, we need healthy food. I'm going to leave it there. Anyway, I'm going to finish uh, my portion of uh, this afternoon by singing. Uh, I want to sing this for Joe. It's called uh, the Adio. Um, I, took, I took the melody based on the... Um, the 15th century music of the Ladino Jews at the time of the Spanish Inquisition when the Jews were um, expelled from Spain. They took their music and some traveled north through Europe and others traveled south to North Africa. And so a couple of hundred years later, Verdi heard this melody and used it at the end of the Traviata. Another hundred years, I hear this music, the original music, in New York City, and I went, I have to sing this song, I'm going to adapt it. And this is my adaptation, and basically, it's in Spanish, uh, based on Ladino, and it says, Goodbye, my dear, I'm happy to know you, you have enriched my life. Your mother, when she brought you to this world, gave you a heart that loves much. Now you seek other... Uh, now you seek other shores, now you knock on other doors, now you flame other loves, but for me, you exist. <coughs> Adio, Adio.
madre quando te dà luz e ci70s, Joe Rosenblatt and me did many tours together throughout Ontario and other far-flung, uh, brilliant places as well. And often he read this, and I love this so much, and Daniel Bradley has let me his very beautiful copy of it, and so hopefully, um, uh, Dr. Chad and me have rehearsed endlessly everything, haven't we? It's very amazing, and you'll see, you'll see the proof of that. Well, actually, actually, these are poems, so you'll hear the proof of it or not, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I think so. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. We will? Okay, excellent. Do I have something in my mouth now? Aha! A Hall's Mentholiptus. It's been ordered off fishermen's friends uh, because they were destroying everything. <laughs> extraterrestrial bumblebee. I wish I were a bumblebee. I wish I were an extraterrestrial bumblebee building flowers or a locked in the greenhouse of my senses. Leaden eyes, heavy, 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 heavy. Oh, the body sings. Oh, the soul weaves in and out. The soul weaves in and out. The bumblebee pays the passion lily a visit. Every moment is an afternoon. Every moment is an afternoon. The soul is in a full eclipse. 
The soul was in a full eclipse. The, the bumblebee is dark, is dark. Oh, the soul was in a full eclipse. The bumblebee is dark, is dark, is dark. Ooh, whoa, whoa. The bumblebee is dark. The bumblebee is uh, so dark. The sun is melting in the wings. The bumblebee, the sun is melting in the wings. The bumblebee is dark. Is dark. Is dark. Is dark. The sun is in the the sun is in the lunch pails. The sun is in the lunch pails of the bumblebee of the bumblebee. The sun is in the lunch pails. Oh, praise the pollen in the lunch pails of the bumblebee. He grabs the pollen of the sun. The sun is in the lunch pails. Praise the pollen in the lunch pails. The lovely bumblebee. The lovely bumblebee uh, shifts his uh, shifts his uh, gears, hmm, hums and and drums in the in the ocean uh, highways of the sun. Uh, the breezes the breezes carry him with his lunch pails, lift the animal up with lunch pails into uh, suburbia. Uh, the animal hum, the bumblebee hum, the bumblebee hum. The bumblebee hum. The bumblebee wears a pilot helmet. His vision is blurred. The pressure of compound eyes. The pressure 26,000 eyes. 26,000 eyes in each eyeball. His vision is blurred. Hexagons. Hexagons. Oh, the pressure. The pressure. The bumblebee. The bumblebee drives in the ocean highways of the sun. With his pole and lunch pails and the passion, lilies cry out to him, Hurry, hurry, we're choking with pollen. Wet fingers hold the pollen up to him. Oh, we're so damn fertile, cry the passion lilies. Get rid of the loads, you dumb buzz animal. Sing the bumblebee, uh, shifting his gears. Me, 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 me. Uh, moving forward, forward, over the growing passion lilies. Fertile, fertile, knocked up passion lilies. The bumblebee uh, brushes away the pollen, brushes away the pollen, brushes away the pollen. Ba, 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 pollen. Into the lunch pails, into the lunch pails, into the, uh, the lunch pails, uh, religious golden pollen, the Midas bread. Oh, the bumblebees, the soul of a mole, uh, burrows into the throat, into Mother Nature's tenement, and the passion lily cry, he's come to collect the rent. The animal is a, a seduce, all that color, all that texture, physical animal, tastes the passion lily, tastes Lick the passion lily, a draw the tongue in, a draw the tongue out, and the passion lily takes the bumblebee, do the tongues in, draw the tongues in, draw the tongues out, taste, taste, here's the fertile powder, cry the white flower, here's the burden, here's the rant. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Well, many, many weeks and many, many months we toured many places, as I've said already, and when I was the most happiest was when Joe read that poem, because it, it is an amazing poem, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now, this is the next thing we're going to do, and then Chad's going to read some poems of his own, uh, is this poem that we've done together before. However, through some uh, madcap computer madcapery, uh, there could be some connection with the neurasthenia, or my own neural pathways. Um, the chorus in this poem is not here in this printing. Uh, isn't that strange when that happens? Does that ever happen? Can we show our hands or anyone that's happened to? And this is, but, so, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, excellent. So we're just going to fill in the chorus as it goes along, aren't we? Yeah, It'll be yeah. genius. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. I came upon the Lenarian pigeons far away from the tiger sharks. Yes, the Lenarian pigeons on the rasta enlarging, pecking for scraps and smells and shells of the allosing through the tremors of could be, in remorsing the lacerative of the eternal thankfulness, and the only mobile or is it was that suspended floating balls and spheres 
turning and moving, gravitation is going forward, is a uh, forearm job, the job of the helmet basement, did he, uh, did he, did he, did he, did he, did he depression, uh, power minds. Sometimes, see the night pigeons, far away from the tiger sharks. A grappling gravel with sometimes the lull, reflect and know, wouldn't you graduate? Oh, sleep, the lift aim of the Lenarian pigeons flying in front of us off on homeward. Aventura, startling and uplifting so close to our faces, giving us a, a sense of continuity, confluenza, a complexa, the dramaturgid was weeping and laughing simultaneously, with her and sighing the refroze arena, Dora, Adora, often signs say don't feed the pigeons, but you notice they never say don't feed the Lenarian pigeons. <laughs> Who on Lenaria hold up the gold and orange grid so the children can play it like a harp to make the energy for everyone there, everyone there. A ship slip is a tone, a pigeon's a rue is a two, oh, OMG, Tom Palm is a... A sculpture, how the Lenarian pigeons roll. Oh Lord, the many master get the heavenly a loot, flute, fluke, a metaphor. A tricky, very clean, it skirts, a shirt's plot, and asparagus. Asparagus, give it a run, <laughs> give it a whirl. Recoup, release, recluse, reflect with ropes, hopes, tropes, we live in honor, shabbat shabbat, atrope. Set again and sing it on, the pigeons find in favor with the rainbow trout. So murmur, soft murmur, tongue, whisper along the ugly lake. How elastic the ceremony could be. Traded with genius in the celery abalone and the state burger, all the tinctures on the grass, the pigeons a lot. All the tinctures in you say of silhouette. You remember the handwriting, all the changing people we change with, interchanging. Loose and narrow. The Sir Madam Conference is in the train like tea. A seminar in Shahadula, a rumple and glistening. As ever, the Lenarian pigeons pick out four fishy scraps and savor the linguid. A Dr. Eamsby reset the drooping brook. And whispered sofa, how real the turgid turning, and the soft spoken longing who's, and the soft spoken longing who's. For the winter fred furnishings of sal, the golden yurt and the whole symphonica, a nature of rising pigeons, suddenly up there and flocking in air. Cooing, cooing, cooing. Can only lull us loud and lull us sing. Coo, coo. The tender Lenarian pigeons cave in, in the window ledges under the eaves tops, inside the gas lights, the harbor we lies, the man of upturned sisters, I talk to the rocks and soon the cooing doves. The Lenarian pigeons go. And the Lenarian pigeons the Lenarian pigeons surprise, the Lenarian pigeons realize it's to harm to fly out of the paws and fly in front of our eyes. Up a power of the six stars. We also realize the Lenarian pigeons sigh, sigh, sigh. The Lenarian pigeons dream of a castle in Sardinia where they used to play up an alley behind the copper kettle and white horse under the northern lights where they used to roundelay. And of course, 
under that old hanging roof, near Big Table Mountain where they used to stay. So many lives, so many dreams, and they all rendezvous in our schemes. However she lived, and when they were astronauts, and when they were carpenters, the Lenarian pigeons saw, and when they were everything, everything, they weren't always pigeons from Lenaria, and making real in our dreams, while we are dreaming, the dreams are real, and the Lenarian pigeons sing and sigh, we are sorry if we ever turned away from love, we are sorry if we ever are turned away from love. <laughs> years ago, I listened to the poetry, then I started to write my own, and I'm here today, and I'm very happy to be here today. It's been an excellent day, and I'm very grateful that we have a good day like this to have. So we'll start. I have a few poems. I'll try not to make them too long, because we've got a few more people to get through. So I'll start now. This one is called, My Mind is Nutty. So I won't drink liquor. I hear voices, so I'm afraid. Because the pale moon is so blasphemous outside, I dread going out at night. I am eternally living with melancholy. So I weep, working our best in this world. So alone, my life is full of challenges. So I am creative. Fine, I find jaw. I create the future. Solely I am one with jaw. Pure observation, pure. Invincibility. The words he said gave hope to the dead. Gray owl told the red, the white man's bullets from their arms shall never do you harm. Here are words. There was a man who traveled at the front of the army, diffusing bombs that would kill, have, would have otherwise killed people. He was invincible to me. As I walked the street, I fear everything around me. I pray for protection. An orange gem blesses my heart and blood and makes me feel invincible. Pick our own, this is called knowledge. Pick our own poetry topic, wisdom. Timeless and eternal, elaborate hopeful dreams, screams from light fiends. We walk through the coolest dreams. The sand poetic amongst our own feet, walking through time eternal. Heading south on the river Nile, against the current, our hands flashing in the water amongst the crocodile. Egyptian cones of incense melting on a woman's head. The scent so beautiful, like cinnamon. <laughs> Is peace possible? Do we all die? Do we all live in a world of possibilities? Isn't anything possible? Life is an event that we, the dreamers, live. Try to imagine nothing. It's possible. And peace is possible. Though every day it seems there is war and killing and violence. Have faith because peace is possible. As the sun rises, my eyes smile. 
a new day shall begin. The eclipse has left us, blood spilt as we sin. Kings lie to people dying in pain. Preach to sinners, life is doomed. Black and red in my brain. So much suffering, life full of pain. The darkness I shall sustain. This is called Asylum Blanche. One. First part. My home, a place to be, safety amongst a cluttered world. Boundaries we all are drawn. To earth, a place to escape death. Driven by angels who often are among us. We congregate together here at Sabbath. With my frustration and fear, anxiety, paranoia, I am afraid. I don't want to talk with them. I hate them sometimes. When I am alone at home, I feel safe. My father's presence makes me feel like I'm in a place of refuge, of asylum, where I am loved and cared for. Church. I pray each day my body is a temple. When I have done wrong, I come to you confession. I cleanse myself of all sins, thank God. When I am at church in a place that is sacred and asylum. Mental Institution 2. Smells like urine, odors like cranberries, walking through halls naked, cigarette flesh burns everywhere. I wouldn't change it for the world. Home sweet home, and the food excellent. Oh boy, what's going on? How many times have I been here? I want to leave. Once I am out, I want to go back. I finally got my side effect medication. This place is helping me. Thank God. I'm not sure who wants to go next, but is anyone on the blue table want to go next, Mara? Sure. Okay. And I have something to read that Myra gave me, a bio biography from her. Myra? Mm -hmm. i read this first. Yeah, I'm just going to say Okay, up cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. No, it's okay. I'll just read it. Myra Jem was born and raised in La Paz, Bolivia, before immigrating as a teenager to Toronto, Canada, to pursue classical dance training. Since the health core collapsed in her early 20s, she has been using songwriting, singing, playing guitar, and drawing as self-healing tools and spiritual practices. Mara started writing poetry by accident in 2013 while trying to improve her lyric writing. Around the same time, she also discovered an intense passion and facility for, for, improved, for improvised sound poetry. She's been sharing her creative expression publicly since 2014. When to her surprise, she was intuitively felt called to do so. And then, Mara, please come to the front. Round of applause. event. Um, I actually didn't know much about Joe Rosenblatt before you invited me, so I've been reading his books and <laughs> I'm so happy you introduced me to him. Um, I've been reading um, The Bird and the Stillness. It's probably my favorite right now. Um, I like how they, uh, in the foreword of that, of that book, he's described as being um, uh, a born-again animist. <laughs> so I want to start with a sound poem. It's called A Round Sound. And lately I've been uh, doing my sound poems 
very melodically, sometimes even bursting into song. <laughs> but it's all going to be improvised, so I don't know what, what's going to happen. <laughs> Corrupted air 
so my body can actually unwind. In short, not really do that much until I, I spotted oil in the canopy. Above all the rest lies ready my concoction, flowering a rhyming text in a nest. I won't stray off my original intention if they let my skirt go on top of that shiny platform shoe. I swear I never thought I'd be the kind of person that needs to be on stage too. I'm more comfortable in the shadows, but now the fit is getting too narrow. I sat still until my next nerve ceased cohesive synergy. It was all I needed to let my cramped up wings unfold their multicolored artillery. Now, I'd like to publicly plant these lines right here, where in the past, a dense entity made my fluid mass into frigid enmity. I'm not afraid anymore of my waking volcano. Friendly burning hand radiantly unlocks this territory's whole circulation. The message spreads wide across, leaving behind only fertile soil where mountain river bodies can floss away sensory deficit. Then delineate each part of these stories with tingly delight. Mapping out regenerative pathways with gentle string fingers, pouring bubbly into the wells of open minds and friendly hearts. The way all water is eventually meant to flow. This is um, in the um, this is this poem is included in the monthly magazine of uh, the Secret Handshake. Check it out online. You can get it. Um, it's called This Siak Connecting, and I'm gonna use a word in the Cree language. Cree, um, Cree people live in Northern Ontario. Um, um, the, the word I'm going to use is called Pash Pash Do. It means woodpecker. I often welcome thoughts of intimate nature to spread their ground beneath the lecture halls of my convention beyond the walls of fragmented alienation. Come one by one to become the whole. Don't linger in old buildings and be a bored, lonesome, loud, swollen, mouth sore. Connecting up from the bottom up through wind whirls of desire enables my mind to weld away Pine oil with resin of sin. This alloy I will use to subdue this thing of my soul's ineffectual, unheard cries. Birthing a chance for my moon's north node to assert an opalescent scented meek gesture that dares put forth an audible question Will you make me uniquely yours? Such is the way my destiny calls, and I want to follow. If only I could save myself from the fascinates of yesterday's lore. Calmly polite the night and swiftly rake the morning away to readily catch the hour of noon by surprise. <laughs> My guitar 
singing with an easily strummed loose the inessential pashmina off of my cautious pash pash day. <laughs> Unencumbered, ungooskin, it would be able to distinctly peck when opportunity comes knocking next. <laughs> Unhinging freedoms, trusting not to rinse the vocal cords first. Silver liquid bells hanging against heaven's wall, wall will hurl their ringing as I pass this thread through the hole of my humble needle, setting up for the next stitch and the next and the next and the next and the next. And the next now I have a um, thank you for coming. <laughs> I have a uh, uh, I did I like to do these doodles. I do them very, very fast. And they're, um, I, I guess, visual impressions of vibrations I sense from people or things or situations. And then I wrote a, a, a poem based on different <coughs> parts of it. So each line has a <coughs> corresponding thing. I'm going to try to point it out, but it's kind of hard because I can't see it. <laughs> It's called Mitochondrial DNA, Mother Side. Microscopic tendrils try to grasp zebra stripes off my parasites. Divided, but not in two. Defense missile launch tries to concavely grab and snip the enemy's nucleus. My nano allies delineate the battle lines and no man's land. I won't call it war though, at the minute level, but I'm cohesive disharmony sometimes. Meanwhile, light as a feather, but with determination, sustenance calmly fades into my stars. The night within turns bright. If I were to cut on the dotted line, step by step, the puzzle would get appropriated, the whole picture lost and fragmented. So I won't. We live at the edge of many lines too at times siding with left or right, peace in then out. <coughs> Still, our roots are all tangled in DNA jungle. And by inherited nature, I focus my periscope on our mitochondrial activity that has been and continues to provide for growth. Now my last poem. Oh, you can. This can go up. Good. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, Wah! Don't blow it. <laughs> okay. So, um, I wrote this just for today. Cool. <laughs> um, because I was reading, Joe described himself. Joe Rosenblatt described himself as having a nature-starved urban imagination. And that was really inspiring for me, and um, I think I may have a, something like that too. <laughs> and, or maybe all of us, you know, if the 
that they're going to see. Um, <coughs> so this is called Inspired by Joe Rosen, that's Nature Starter of Imagination. Um, but I'm, I gotta say, it came out really linearly for me. I So it was a surprise. I don't know how I feel about it. But it's about the city, the nature of the city. It's possible for me to ponder over ponds of ecstasy in numinous plains, even as I walk this concrete lane. For was it not also a river once? Its watery ghost inhabits the loins of the dense street matter. Its murmur reminds me, science is not evil, it's greed that distorts it. We could pay more for the non-toxic formulas, but let's not. More money in our pockets. Less humans on the planet, or at least more suffering. But anything goes as long as there's way more than enough for us, us, us. Not them, because they are not us. Or so it's been said. The city, made of greed, corrupted nature, layers upon layers of domination with the smallest hearts always on top. The city thwarts complex ego systems to divide and conquer. Oh yes, it's survival of the fittest or so we delude then conclude. It's all about being in control. Tiny little people in control of universes older than they'll ever truly know. Big delirious pirates on the go. Or is this all just my imagination? Do you see it too? Everything is nature. Even greed and hate, I guess. But some things create blood, and others make life bleed. Human talent for destruction may know no bounds, but there is a way to say no to that. Couldn't we now rescue seeds instead? Don't enough people realize the act of creation is true wealth? Equanimous harmony, egalitarian creativity, caring connectivity. Have you ever breathed in such rare air? <coughs> I have. It's called forest bathing. And with science now, the why and how of it are beginning, only beginning to be explained. It's all happening, even in the ravine, in between this very urban scene. Yes, humic descendants will slowly but surely alkaline all this Just four words. 
I invite you to say and with a break in between. So it's going to sound like this. Let's plant urban forests. Let's plant urban forests. Let's plant urban forests. Okay. Wow. So nice 
nice to be here. Um, okay. I'm gonna read an academic essay. I don't want it to be too stuffy. I don't know how Joe would feel about an academic essay, but that's okay. Bill, thank you for the We sent him an email asking. He didn't read No response. No response. That's, What's up with that? It happens. I guess. Uh, also, I forgot to wish you this yesterday, but happy, like, rest day. Happy belated. That awesome, was like... Awesome, thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, love you, Bill. Happy birthday, birthday. Happy birthday to you. 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 Mwah. Mwah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm gonna read this essay, and then I'm gonna read a short, uh, poem that is a response slash a gloss of this essay. Uh, okay, so this is called, <clears throat> and this is in the newsletter if you want to follow along, if you want to read alongside me at the same time, simultaneously. Um, and whenever I, I say buzz buzz, I would like it if the audience could possibly start buzzing. Okay. This is also about the bee poems. We've talked about the bee poems a little bit today. So this is called hmm, The Radical Sounds of Joe Rosenblatt's Apiary. Joe Rosenblatt was one of the most prolific and beloved Jewish-Canadian writers of our time, with over 30 collections of poetry and prose published between 1966 and 2019. Throughout his career, he cultivated a poetic space in which various ecologies, both human and non-human, intersect to create a unique brand of surrealism. In various interviews, he admits that he writes to, quote, escape hyper-reality, genocide of man, elephants, and fish, because it allows him to float into, quote, a dream state and create an escapist literature. Critics, nevertheless, often overlook the theoretical richness of his work. In one of the pieces, of, in one of the few pieces, very few pieces of scholarly criticism written on Rosenblatt, Alfredo Rosardi concludes that his poems are, quote, undoubtedly the stuff that dreams are made on. <clears throat> well, <laughs> right? While Rosenblatt may intentionally perform the role of a dreamer, if not seer, or modernist poet prophet, uh, his mode of dreaming is loud and it's messy, and his lines of flight are not simply forays into a decadent imagination. They are political musings on the nature of community as an ecological happening. Ooh, spicy. Focusing specifically on Bumblebee Dithyram, this essay explores how sonic and visual quirks summon what Rosenblatt calls an animal rhythm, a linguistic and graphemic momentum which induces the becoming bee of the human and the becoming human of the bee. With this, the text constitutes a political, poetic, that mystically meditates on the tensions between Rosenblatt's own Jewishness and the tense ethos out of which he was writing. Buzz, 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 buzz. Oh, you're so good at that. Wow. <laughs> the original printing of the Dithyram commences with a piece of sheet music entitled Burdens with musical notation by Faye Rosenblatt. The lyrics are handwritten, greeting readers with the intimacy of unique and nearly illegible penmanship. They go as follows, and because I don't read sheet music and I've never heard this performed, I usually just uh, just do my own little interpretation with my own favorite uh, tunes. With helicopter power, they bring their burdens home. Some of them don't make it, they fall into a stream. And drown their burdens down bumblebees in black pilot caps of light on pastures of dreams. They drain the juice of the rose, they drain the juice of the rose, cool in the pond of flowers, while up above some fly with helicopter power, with sacks of gold dust on their legs, their burdens bring them down. End quote. Here, the bees are brought into a comparative, quasi-anthropomorphic framework where neither bee nor human is privileged. While the worker bees take on human traits, this is not necessarily a means of critiquing human alienation under capitalism and the consequen consequential disconnect from nature. 
On the contrary, the speaker denaturalizes theory of the natural, or nature itself, rather than lauding it. The labor of bees is not a fetishizable counterpart or antidote to capitalistic violence, nor are the bees safe from alienation themselves. They are named nature's proletarian throughout the text as they bring their burdens home, while some of them don't make it and fall into a stream. Given that they are proletarian, the violence of a class system specific to nature is very much at play. Rosenblatt's analogy is curious, as the speaker brings pollination in close proximity to automation, roboticism. Whereas the bourgeoisie exploit the labor of humans, here, nature itself is an exploitative, destructive force, rendering bees mechanized workers. Beautiful and easily romanticized representations of nature are irrelevant in Rosenblatt's ecologies. The light on pastures of dreams is always already dependent on the proximity that these critters have to the sublimity of helicopter power and the unrelenting imperative to drain the juice of the rose. In the dithyram, sublimity is a kind of imminence or presence upon which beauty depends. Furthermore, any and all human descriptors work to flatten out or negate common ideas of species-based hierarchies, such that the being of bees and humans are placed on an equal plane. To denaturalize nature, Rosenblatt flattens an array of ontologies. In this sense, the exploitation of workers becomes a fundamental truth across species. Y'all okay? How you doing? Yeah. Yeah. Buzz, buzz. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Delicious. Oh, you're great. As Rosenblatt's bees labor away, taking on various occupations haphazardly, from shamanic producers of an animal rhythm all the way to store clerks who bring home the groceries, hmm, they pollinate the text with vibration and help make the poems matter. In The Bee is Breathing in the Womb, the speaker begins, Oh, the lovely bee is breathing in the womb, the animal is breathing. Here, an uncanny vitalism once again entangles human and bee. Rather than emerging from an egg, bees come into existence by way of the womb. The entire first section of the poem is a chant in celebration of the strange fertility. Splayed out on the page like an earthy concrete poem designed to resemble the form of a flower, with the pistol comprised of a repetitive sequence of the titular phrase and the stem as the word breathing, which is then shortened to breathe and finally to breath in the final lines. It is a movement from verb to noun, from form to content, in a single sequence. In this breathiness, the bees are highly sexualized, so horny, and always already in the process of touching each other, pollinating, creating, working, and playing. Many of the pieces in the dithyram are concrete poems, employing a visual materiality that dovetails with the sonic movements of the poem as script. The typesetting and the layout of the bees breathing in the womb jumps from clean concrete to dirty concrete and back again as the image of a flower transforms into the sporadic path of a bumblebee in flight, buzz buzz, where words run together and pull apart, becoming objects, things, thinking about, touching and tantalizing the page's ink and vice versa in the same instant that the, that the poem becomes vibratory matter. As Greg Hange contends in Noise Matters, the tangibility of sound is present at a, quote, subatomic level where matter moves around a central point situated at the average coordinate of the trajectory traced by, by the vibration of matter, end quote. Consequently, there are multiple modes of eroticism at play in the frantic repetition of phrases and the inky mess of the lines, creating a synesthetic experience that prods both readers and listeners out of interpretive complacency, demanding both a corporal awareness moving from an embodied human subject to that of a mythical creature sounding itself into existence. I just love bees. I have a bee right here, so it's always hanging out with me. Thanks, Joe. While both human and bee experience laborious alienation, they simply cannot get enough of it. This readerly alienation from the self is a joy intrinsic to noise making and becoming other. In mother's and mother nature pro mother nature's proletarians, which is 
probably my favorite of the collection. Bees are alienated from their labor but cannot resist its compulsively, uh, it compulsively returning to the hive. Buzz Buzz, quote, bees are truck drivers of the skies who burrow into diners of flowers to be fed therein and overhauled. I'll try another flower, think the honeybee. Tastes so goddamn delicious, this flower, um, oh, so do odor and color. Buzz Buzz, flip flip, pregnant with proletarian bug song. They carry their fright of pollen groceries home to mama, the boss queen. Ooh. These descriptive lines are immediately met by the spastic joy these tasks bring to the bees. Buzz. The poems, then, are not simply an imaginative exercise in surrealism, but interactive experiences that rupture one's relationship to the body as functional and labor-producing. While no single meaning can be derived from these vague hypnotic phrases or their performances, this apparent meaninglessness is immediately met by the imminence of the body sensing its surroundings, as well as itself. It goes on like this for several lines until the letters of the word buzz overtake the page and move in strange, unpredictable directions. The word operates as both a line of flight from the operations of the traditional poem and human life as we know it, However, this is not so much a defeatist escapism as it is the desire for something other than the given world. Indeed, this embodied vibratory cum concrete poem is not merely a blurring of subjectivity. On the contrary, Rosenblatt induces a confusion of borders by way of a potent and fertile corporality that mirrors certain tenets of Kabbalah's, and I definitely read Joe as a uh, Jewish-Canadian poet par excellence. Uh, but before returning to Joe's relationship to mysticism, it's necessary to examine what inspired these curious ecological and embodied modes of writing. Looking to the context in which the book is written, we find that Joe uses animalization to interrogate his own Jewishness in the socio-political fields of Canada. Bumblebee, Bumblebee Dithyram is an indirect response to the presence of anti-Semitism in Toronto, a presence that invaded a space of which he was very fond. In July of 1962, Milton Acorn and a group of poets, including Joe, visited Allen Gardens in downtown Toronto to protest uh, bylaws that prohibited oration in the city's parks. Ironically, their protests uh, opened up too much space for free speech. Not long after, a great deal of reform was made in the uh, municip municipality, such that, quote, anyone had a right to speak on condition that one received a permit issued by the Commissioner of Parks and Rec. The only stipulation was time and place. In the years following the poet's protest, there was a significant increase in the distribution of anti-Jewish hate literature, courtesy of white supremacist groups in the United States trying to extend the parameters of their influence. The possibility of a Nazi threat in Canada continued to escalate as time passed. In the wake of a series of hateful protests or outbursts, Holocaust survivors residing in Toronto began to radicalize, coming together to practice anti-fascist uh, tactics. Right on. The New Park bylaw prompted by poets in protest no doubt led to a number of significant readings and encouraged uh, groups like the Embassy Poets to gather and explore their writerly talents. But nevertheless, it also led to the possibility of hate groups speaking out on public platforms, which culminated in a riot on the 31st of May, 1965, at which thousands of Torontonians uh, from or in support of the Jewish community gathered. During this short time, a, quote, hysterical mob of 5,000 watched as eight suspected Nazis were beaten with fists, clubs, and boots, according to an issue of the Toronto Star. <laughs> The outcome of the riot was extremely beneficial and binding for the Jews of the city, offering a sense of community. Although the riot only lasted less than 15 minutes, it was nevertheless a seminal event in Toronto's Jewish community in the post-war era. The Allen Garden Free Speech Riot, indirectly prompted by Rosenblatt and his contemporaries, created a certain harmoniousness amongst a rather disparate ecology of Jews residing in Toronto, while this may seem like a far-reaching argument, Rosenblatt is eager to confirm the influence of Allen Gardens on his work. 
Quote, I was so influenced by Emily Dickinson, especially her bee poems, that I started an experimental series on bees capturing their sounds and sights in Allen Gardens in Toronto back in 1962. The sights and sounds of this very particular and historical site are not just inspiring, but constitutive of Rosenblatt's imaginative foundations. Buzz, buzz. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. By defamiliarizing the space of Allen Gardens with surrealist methods, Rosenblatt incessantly returns to a time and place that is fraught with tension in order to unpack his own influence on the space. The poems, however, are reclamations in multiple ways. As Jay Geller points out in his book Bestiarium Judaicum, there is a long, violent history between representations of animals and those of Jews. Quote, the animalization of the Jew did not begin with the biologization of Jew hatred by racial anti-Semitism. Rather, over the past two millennia, a vast menagerie of verbal and visual images of non-human animals, pigs, dogs, vermin, wordeds, apes, and so on, has been disseminated to debase and bestialize the Jew. In other words, animalization is part and parcel of Jewish cultural trauma, by using the metaphoric force of animalization to create and explore a zodiac of his own wit, Rosenblatt denaturalizes the logic of anti-Semitism and turns it against itself. In a similar vein, we might look to Jewish mysticism as a means of solidifying our understanding of Bumblebee Dithyram as a text indebted to various ideas of Jewishness. In The Lunatic Muse, Rosenblatt describes an encounter with a Jewish individual questioning his fixation on bees. Quote, the poker face member of a Jewish book club who, after hearing my bee poems and egg sonatas, popped a startling, surreal question unintentionally. Tell me, he said quite sweetly, an egg I can understand as a symbol of the universe now, but what's so Jewish about a bumblebee, right? I related this literary event to my mentor, Al Purdy, who never liked my bee poems in the first place. You should have told him your fucking bee is circumcised, end quote. What is Jewish about bees is precisely their proximity to trauma, which is not unlike the relationship between mysticism and sociopolitical upheaval. Kabbalah, for instance, emerged as a response to cultural trauma by the Jews, with its popularity spiking at particularly poignant points in history. Indeed, the need to inject an uncanny body into spirituality has a long history in the context of Judaism. Looking briefly to the genealogy of Jew Jewish mysticism, there are various adherences to vitality, corporality, and ultimately vibratory matter, as we've already seen today. According to Sh uh, Gershom Sholem, an emphasis on eroticism and ecstasy is particularly prevalent in the writings of the Kabbalists of Safad, Subsequent to the Jewish expulsion from Spain in 1492, Safad became a safe haven for Jewish culture, uh, consciousness after exile and diaspora made the Kabbalah public property. While the expulsion propelled messianic and apocalyptic sentiments into the core of Jewish mysticism, certain pantheistic views also found their way into the mix as the practices became more and more dispersed. Just prior to the emergence of Isaac Luria's extreme mysticism of language and the holy names was Moses Ben Jacob Cordovera's system in which the divine emerges from the depths of its own being and acts like a living organism. Similarly, Rosenblatt's text emerges from the depths of its own being to act like a living organism, renewing itself with each reading and performance. As Joe agrees, every crisis produces poets. In response to this mode of hyper-real living and the violence of sharing a space with one's oppressor, Rosenblatt offers a bestial vision of a unified Jewish left. This is not an everyday escapism, cum transcendence, but a grounded brand of surrealism that is aware of its own limitations and the immensity of its aspirations. That's the essay. Thanks for listening to that. <laughs> Uh, do you, do you wanna you wanna hear this uh, this uh, poem? Yes. Okay. Wow, that's so nice. You're so attentive. Okay, this poem is called "Squelch to Buzz," uh, blatting for sweet finity.
I imagined Emily Dickinson imagining Joe Rosenblatt, imagining Emily Dickinson imagining Joe Rosenblatt, and it's a whole lot of hmm when these children illegitimately endow themselves once over umbilical cords tickling a pinch of honey slipped retroactivities and archival proclivities, a biolact strapped to the lick of their Grinch. Buzzing bites through socialist space-time, ketchup, mustard, relish, drones, prayer, oh, Emily, oh, Joe, the condiments are yours. Take heed there, but mama papas, deconforming, humming with the heaves of fricked frictionals, otherwise hyper in the deep space of the real of a yearly, etc., engendering some kind of multitude with some kind of M-dashed weaponry or page-plucked glossal sorcery. Whose loon ticks more in the night of a muse-born square dance with wings a bumbling? Who dares pray with unanswered believers? Oh, it's just J and M jamming for honey. Solar-hued insects nourish the blues, hijacking a hijacker in lo-fi velocities, busily occupied, clustering, reeking of havoc and other love poems. Joe leagues for the jeers against some Miltonic diatribe. It's all strategic. It's all buzziness. And Canada blesses his Talmudic shoulders with some honey and a few apples, but it's never enough or enough of never. Our boobies do fuzz a tussock of cause, nuzzling off the rosers with the snazzers with rosers and the razzers of a post-hazard cookout. Ooh, the remnants of the face screeching for a neo satyr with and without that hamburger helper called postmodernism. What's dogmatic secularity, if not a mystical could be, a basic and beefy worker bee, hardening its union knees in the upper of an intellection telethon? Funding another Cuban revolution, unloading boxcars with sustained, sustained levity, a milkshake shaking with the thought of Marx buzzing Lenin, buzzing Trotsky. Ooh, thanks again. The principle of life is a summer in Allen, gardening so much fun from an SPF 50 covered stun while six in a million folks beat those fuckos to a pulp and gloss community. Oh, so the bees are circumcised, Al? Manic shoppers, burglars of the soul, cross-pollinating and topping elephant fetishists. So many shriveled sweet peas, a Judaic undertow that you can't knock over with a pail of holy water. An acorn acronym splays to the earth like Mama Papa at the MoMA on a bleached out Sunday at Calicum. A day's worth of a day's worth is seeking the camaraderie of shells and smells and other buckle buccaneers to offer Kaddish. Well, here goes nothing. Our lives are Swiss and all bees are gymnasts, rising to roar out of roots when Emily, like a guardian of the galaxy, sashays for Joe and Joe dashes for M, glipping that proteins are best absorbed when our rives are rotisseried by tender fingers buttoning erasers to the slickness of an apiary. The parabellum coagulates at the bottom of your barrel, loaded like a nun hemming and hooming through the tempest of a green weathered shul. The hives bleed out their membership cards for the League of Canadian Poets and throw them into the sucrose sweat of Georgia Strait. Ooh, no, no, I've almost forgotten the boss queen and the way an apiary can be so slick and real. The way a bee can grace us with a sting upwards like the way a heavy little waist may lay waste to the distance it creates through a jumble, a splice of bumble. Oh, Joe, it's off to the two-fro, where from Emily and such like company, you continue to buzz in the syrup of a socialist glow. Buzz, 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 buzz. Buzz, 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 boss queen, boss queen, oh, buzz, buzz, boss queen, oh, buzz, buzz, boss queen, boss queen, I miss you, I love you, boss queen, oh, boss queen, I love you, adieu, boss queen, adieu, boss queen. Thanks. I'm tired. There are two empty seats right here. That was very good. I liked it a lot. Thanks. Now, the last person, I don't even know who it is, but their name is here. I can't really do a bio for them because I don't know them. But their name, it's Susan Walker. 
Let's have a right Thanks, Phil, for inviting me to be part of this tribute. I always love to hear you read that. Um, and I apologize in advance for things that have already been mentioned about Joe. Uh, anyone who hung around the literary scene in Toronto in the 1970s knew and admired Joe Rosenblatt. He was the poet's poet, an artist, a visionary in whatever mode he chose to express himself. Joe was born and grew up in Toronto. He and his family lived near Kensington Market, where his uncle Nathan was a fishmonger whom young Joe sometimes assisted. At public school, he remembered an English teacher named Mr. Scott, imbued in him, already a dreamer, a love of English poetry. Poetry seemed to come as naturally to Joe as breathing. And only Dickinson, he said, was the center of my poetic universe. Joe's path as a poet coincided with the development of independent Canadian publishing. His first book, The LSD Leacock, was published in 1966 by the Coach House Press. Joe earned the Governor General's Award for Poetry for a book published by Press Poetry, Topsoil Selected Poems. To those who enjoyed his company as much as his artistry, Joe seemed very much rooted in Toronto. I remember, after learning that he had moved to Qualicum Beach on Vancouver Island, wondering how Joe would fit in there. It was a place beloved to me, because it was where my family vacationed each summer when I was growing up in Victoria. But I couldn't imagine what would nourish the imagination of Joe Rosenblatt. Little did I know. To Toronto centrists, weren't we all? Joe was in exile. But the fact was he remained very busy writing, drawing, and painting, fishing, and walking in the woods. For an artist who had this direct, as well as a mystical connection to nature, Qualicum was an ideal habitat. At the home he shared with his wife, the pianist and piano teacher, Faye Smith, uh, who was also a well-known conservationist, of the, and his son Silas, across the old highway from a public stretch of Qualicum Beach, Joe was immersed in the wild. Outside his kitchen window, besides Bay's prodigious vegetable garden, grouse and quail crisscrossed the lawn, and all manner of birds alighted on bird feeders. Raccoons, squirrels, and several generations of house cats coexisted under the fruit trees. When Joe was painting or drawing, he would sit by a window that looked onto this active world of his backyard. In Qualicum, his myth-making imagination thrived in a daily relationship with all forms of plant and animal life. Sometimes after the fall of 2009, when I returned to Victoria, I made friends with Joe on Facebook. After he, after he published a notice of an art show in his backyard, I drove up to have a look and came away with an oil and paper painting that featured a spherical green man, like a hovering god, and a small drawing he'd done for Barry Callahan's hog poems. Joe was surrounded by friends in Qualicum Beach. Many were artists, musicians, and writers. Joe and Faye's home was a gathering place. And Joe, who sometimes projected the persona of a curmudgeon, was a generous host. I was always welcome to stay in the wing he called the guest house. I was glad to be Joe's friend and collector of his art. And when I got the job of copy editing, hogwash the Callahan and Rosenblatt epistolary convergence, we became jo joint editors. Joe, who referred to himself as a high school dropout and held no academic credentials, bore a keen intellect and, for years, and was for years senior editor of the literary magazine Jewish Dialogue. In Hogwash, Joe Rosenblatt, known as J.R., takes on Callahan's James Hogg in his own poetic terms. Much wit and wisdom ensues. Meanwhile, Joe was at work on a collection that Porcupine's Quill would publish in 2016, The Bird in the Stillness, Forest Devotionals. Beautifully designed and illustrated with Joe's paintings and drawings, this collection presented a poet, now in his 80s, at the height of his craft. It was, to me, it was something of an outrage that The Bird in the Stillness went unmentioned in the annual prize list, but Joe had no truck with awards and prizes. It was for him, enough for him to know his work was out there. The crazy, surrealistic side of Joe's feverish creation emerged 
in a book published by Exile in 2015 called Snake City. Fiction, but not exactly a novel. Snake City is a Rosenbladian narrative of Freddy, a retired Canadian snowbird, and his encounters with Cottonmouth, a viper who personifies male sexual predation, and a swamp woman named Hilda. Joan himself was a little surprised by the shape that Snake City took. But the book has a kinship with the prose and poetry that came out in his final work, Bite Me, Losing on Monsters and Mayhem. As Joe explained in an introduction entitled My Hungry News, invite me, I am letting the famished imagination out on a field trip. It matters little whether I'm following the ex explorations of ethnobotanists or zoologists. What I am keenly interested in is the bizarre side of Mother Nature's handiwork in the wilds of a tropical rainforest. I have this obsession with undiscovered gigantism and boa constrictors assumed to be extinct relegated to prehistory along with the dinosaur. I want to chant I want to chant a mantra in celebration of those lengthy elongated reptiles. Come out of hiding. I know you are here. I know you are there. Joe had an idea for a bestiary for a while and it must have percolated over the months of Faye's final illness. But Bite Me mostly emerged in the year after her death in March 2017. As Joe's own health began to decline, the composition of the book, alternating poems and prose vignettes, seemed driven by the energy of grief. This will be my swan song, he would say, as I joined him in the summer of 2018 to go over the pages before he submitted the manuscript to Tim Inkster at Portrait by Coil. It was amazing to see how the book developed, the poems and the prose and the drawings falling into pace as Joe imagined the work as a whole. It was also heartbreaking to see the self-awareness of the poet envisioning his own end in the permeating silence. Reader, come fly with me over the volcanic cauldron. The flowing magma of the psyche is bubbling away. Now hold on tight to my plumy coat as we soar above these lingering puffs of smoky, acrid clouds. Again, I find that I'm alone and talking to myself, and in the process, I've awoken my slumbering muse. Perhaps it's best for readers who absorb my musings to stay safely on the ground when viewing my ascent. The octogenarian in the Birdman is cognitively wired, though he's immersed in flights of fancy, in flying toward that all-devouring event horizon. But mercifully, poet's gravitational pull hauls his body back to earth. I seem to have made a friend of the permeating silence. It's as though my entire skull has become a granite crypt. I will be missing Joe and Faye for a long time to come. Since Joe's death in March, I haven't made the drive up to Qualicum Beach. Knowing the childhood joy of coming over the crest of the hill that leads to the beach and later to the house where Joe and Faye shared so many happy years will be tinged with sadness in their absence. <laughs> December 15th on a Sunday. Yeah. Okay? Because we have lots of things. The holidays will have space. Yeah, holidays will have space. Everyone's welcome to the 15th of December one. We'll see you there. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Nice to see you.